You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy, New Fellow Orientation Series from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 18, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Allergy Billing and Coding. Our presenter is Dr. Gary Gross. He's the Executive Vice President of the Joint Council of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and a practicing allergist in Dallas, Texas. So our next presenter is Dr. Gary Gross. Dr. Gross is an Executive Vice President of the uh, Joint Council on Allergy, uh, Asthma, and Immunology. Uh, he's also in private practice in Dallas, Texas. We, we were complaining earlier about how hot it here is here in Kansas City. I guess we really can't complain because you're probably hotter in Dallas, aren't you? No, we've uh, we've been chilly here. It's, it got down actually to 102 yesterday, and so we were all kind of uh, shivering. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> cool wave. Uh, all right. <laughs> anyway. Patient this morning just told me that uh, we, we haven't set the record yet this year, so I guess we can't complain yet. Well, you're, you're working on it, I can tell. Anyway, Dr. Gross has agreed to talk with us this morning about billing and coding. It's something that us academic allergists know nothing about and cannot teach our fellows, so uh, we need some help from the professionals. So, so Dr. Gross has agreed to, uh, to talk with us. He's, he's kind of thought of as the guru of billing and coding in allergy. So um, there's your presentation, and uh, welcome to Conferences Online, Allergy Dr. Gross. Thank you, Jay. And uh, for those of you who are here, let me uh, tell you, you've just heard uh, Dr. Dykowitz tell you one of the aspects of the, the bread and butter of allergy, allergic rhinitis, uh, but that doesn't get the bread and butter on the table without the proper billing. So what we'll try and cover in the next uh, hour is the aspects of billing that you need to know so that you can uh, be paid for the services that you provide. And the next slide. I, uh, this is the objectives uh, really are just to understand the principles of coding uh, what we call E&M building, which we'll go into. That's uh, evaluation and management. We'll talk about specific allergy codes that you will be using every day. And then finally, uh, some ways to avoid coding errors. And on the next slide, uh, and then the next slide, uh, I want to emphasize that a lot of the answers to your coding questions are actually on the computer. And my favorite source, when I get a, a question from somebody about how do I do this or what code do I use, uh, is, uh, of course, Google. And I will Google their question or Google something about what they've asked. And usually I'll uh, get a, a whole list of possible sources of information that I will use. The next slide has some sources that might be good for you to have. Uh, there are two sets of guidelines for coding. And one is the 1995 guideline. That's the top link that you have. And the second is the 1997 guideline. And there's some uh, vague differences in these, primarily related to the physical exam. And we usually recommend that people follow the 1995 guideline because it's a little more allergy friendly in that the allergy specific exam is in the eyes of the beholder. That is, you can kind of decide, if I've done a complete comprehensive physical examination, what does that mean? And you don't have to be at the mercy of somebody else to tell you what a comprehensive uh, physical examination means. So the 95 guidelines are nice. And, and Medicare has said, when we audit your charts, we're going to go by the, the easiest one. That is, whatever fits your documentation, that's the guideline that we'll use. And we've told people that for years. You can use either guideline you want. Over the past couple of years, we found that some private insurance companies totally disregarded that. And the one that I can tell you for sure disregards it is Cigna. And what they do is they use only the 1997 guidelines. So they, if they audit your chart or if they ask for why you've done something or why you've coded something a certain way, they will only recognize the 1997 guidelines. So uh, in general, either one is good. But for certain insurers, you have to use the one that they use. I put a few other websites on the on the slide for you as well. Uh, CMS uh, governs the way we do things. That is uh, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, 
governs, and they have manuals online. So if you have specific questions, oftentimes you can go to these online manuals and find out what their rules are. And then you can get some uh, information, this AMA uh, uh, publications. There is a, a uh, particular area on there that you can uh, highlight that is related to CPT, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but you can get more recent information sometime on the AMA website, particularly for vaccine codes, than you can in other places. And then finally, the Joint Council of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. As Jay uh, mentioned, my uh, conflict of interest here is that I'm the Executive Vice President of that, uh, of that organization, and uh, we promote it highly that you join and that you become a member, and uh, fellows can join for nothing. Very good price for fellows. Hey, Gary, Gary this is Paul Dowling. Um, thanks for doing this, but um, I haven't seen anything or heard anything that the, the fellows have gotten um, invited to join. Uh, we have you know new fellows starting. Is is that something the office is doing, sending out? Uh, good question. I I can check on that, Paul. I do not know the answer. I I know that if you go to the website as a fellow, you can go to the website and you can download an application and indicate that you are a fellow and join that way. Okay. So we will download them immediately. Because um, it's something that all fellows should participate in and all allergists should, and it's not a conflict of interest, it's a public service. So thank you for your service. Next. Very good. Okay, in, we're going to go over some general coding information, uh, and, and this is important because you have to understand why people want this information. And people are paying you for your services, so they may uh, ask you to document that you have done what you say you have done, and they may want specific information, one of which is the site of service. We, we generally see people in our office, and so the site of service is generally going to be an outpatient office. Uh, sometimes we're called to do a consult in a hospital, so we'll see a patient in a hospital. If the office bills for that, the site of service is different. They're, the site of service is the hospital, and the reason this is important is because the overhead component is different. If you're in your office, you're paying for everything yourself, so the overhead is higher. If you're doing something in a hospital, the hospital is is footing some of the bill, and so the overhead is going to be less. And Medicare has gotten very sticky about this, and one of the way one of the places they're auditing the most now is for when uh, doctors put down the wrong side of service. It might be an oversight, and if it is, it's not a big problem. You can just explain that you made a mistake. But you have to put down the right side of service or you're going to be, get paid something different from what they think you should be paid and what you probably are entitled to. The other thing that's important is medical necessity. And we could bill everything at the top tier and be paid a lot more money, but uh, it wouldn't be, we would be doing things that weren't medically necessary. So it's, it's important when you think about what you're going to provo provide for a patient that you don't overutilize lab tests, that you don't do things that are not necessary, and the insurance companies are looking at this more and more. Why did this person bill such a high-level code when the patient just came in for a runny nose? So there are some uh, conflicts here, and I think if we practice good medicine, we, we do what's medically necessary, and we do the appropriate diagnostic testing and services, we're not going to be in any trouble. It's just if we start overutilizing or billing uh, because somebody says that you can make more money if you bill for more things that we get in trouble. And then we have to report all what we've done accurately and completely. Uh, and on the next slide, you can see uh, in further uh, rules that the, the medical records have to be complete and legible. And if you're using uh, any kind of written record, what you write down has to be legible. If you're using electronic records, it's obviously a little bit easier, but you still have to comply with the documentation. The legibility is a little easier. Uh, each patient encounter should have basic essential information. The reason for the encounter, usually represented by the chief complaint, uh, the history, the physical examination. We want to know some information about what, we've, what we're thinking, that is the assessment, the clinical impression, because that goes into our medical decision making. And then we want a plan. We want a, a goal. And then, obviously, if, if you are, again, writing, it has to be uh, dated and signed, and it has to be signed legibly. On the next slide, you can see the, the, uh, some simple things that we talk about in medicine all the time. If something is not specifically documented, then uh, we should be able to figure out why we did something 
from the records. It's much easier to say I'm doing pulmonary function tests because this patient has described shortness of breath or shortness of breath should be in the note as a reason for doing the pulmonary function test. If your note says this patient came in with allergic rhinitis and you do pulmonary function tests and you forget to write down that the patient also had a cough, then people aren't going to know why you did pulmonary function tests. It seems like an unnecessary test. So you have to kind of tie everything together. Uh, you should have all the diagnoses. You should have an understanding of uh, the uh, response to treatment. So in, in progress notes, particularly with asthma, you want to know if you started a person on a new medicine, did they get better, did they get worse? In allergic rhinitis, if you have somebody on immunotherapy and you don't indicate whether the patient is getting better on immunotherapy or not, not uh, having any problems with their immunotherapy, then an insurer may come by later and say, well, why are you keeping this patient on this uh, form of therapy when you've never indicated to us that it's really helping your patient? So you need some information in all your notes as to follow up and, and what their response has been to therapy. Okay, with that said, let's get into specifics. The next page gives you, or the next slide gives you the, the books that you need. Uh, everyone should get these books every year. The CPT book shown on your left and the ICD-9 book shown on the right. The CPT book gives you information about coding for specific uh, visits and procedures. The ICD-9 book gives you diagnoses, and you need both when you bill an insurance company. On the next slide, we'll start talking about uh, office visit coding. And these are called E&M visits, as I mentioned earlier, and they're for the evaluation and management of a patient. And it can be a new patient visit, a consultation. Uh, if you see patients in the hospital, it pertains to that. And what you have to do when you, when you see these patients uh, and decide what level of, of charge you're going to submit to the insurance company is decide uh, among five different levels of codes that they have. And we'll talk about each one of these levels. And as we talk about them, I want you not so much to concentrate on uh, the details, but just to kind of get a picture of what we're trying to do. And then I think I'll show you some cheat sheets that you can use uh, to, to, to use the details each time you see a patient. So on the, the next slide, we're looking at a new patient, uh, what's called a level one visit. This is the lowest uh, length and effort that you will spend with a new patient. It's 99201 is the code. And all these codes are in that CPT book. This is, they say that this is all from the CPT book. So it's usually a presenting problem or self-limited, minor, and the physician typically spends 10 minutes face-to-face -face with the patient and or the family. Okay, there are a couple of important points in here. These are for visits that are face-to-face. -face. So they're not for telephone visits. They're not for talking to somebody's friend about the patient. They're for face-to-face. -face. But if you're talking about a, a, a child, an infant, you may be talking to the parents, and that counts as a face-to-face uh, -face visit. So if you're talking to the family about the patient or you're talking to the patient per se, it's a face-to-face -face visit. And it describes what is required. It, it requires a, what's called a, a problem focus history, a problem focused exam, and straightforward medical decision making. And we'll talk about each one of those things as we uh, go into this a little deeper. On the next slide, you can see what a level two visit is. And you can see there are a couple of changes, longer time, now we're looking at what's called an expanded problem-focused history, expanded problem-focused exam, and a straightforward medical decision-making effort. When you're doing any new patient visit, you need all three of these components to be satisfied to be able to bill for that level of visit. So if you have, uh, for instance, in an expanded problem-focused history, you have an expanded problem-focused examination and straightforward medical decision-making, uh, you can bill for it. But if you only have a problem-focused history, but everything else qualifies, then you would bill for the lower level, the level one. So all three components have to be what you're looking at here or better to be able to bill for this visit. And let me just say that we're looking at, at new patients. Uh, the follow-up visits are going to be very similar uh, with the uh, follow-up visit level two you'd be looking at an easier physical examination, an easier history. Those are, those are not expanded problem-focused. Those are just problem-focused. And then again, the straightforward 
medical decision making. Uh, if you look at the next slide, level three, you can see that we're getting a little more, uh, spending a little more time. Here the estimated time is going to be about 30 minutes, and now it's called a detailed history and detailed examination and medical decision making of low complexity. And then finally, or the next slide, level four, uh, on a new patient visit, they expect you to be spending about 45 minutes face-to-face -face time, but the, the key criteria that you have to satisfy to bill for this are going to be the comprehensive history, comprehensive physical, and moderate complexity in medical decision making. And then finally, the uh, level five visit, which we as allergists don't bill a lot uh, because it's a comprehensive uh, history and exam and high complexity medical decision making. And as we go through these, you can see why we don't bill them a lot. Okay, on the next slide, we'll get into what does this, uh, what does this gibberish actually mean? And here you can see the histories that I just talked to you about, the problem focus, the expanded problem focus, the detailed, and the comprehensive. And you can see that they all require a, a chief complaint. So the first thing you put on your chart is a chief complaint. What does the patient come in uh, complaining of? And then as you look across here, you can see that, uh, that for instance, we talked about 99202 level 2 required an expanded problem focused uh, history. So for that, you would need uh, the history of the present illness. It could be brief. You would need some review of systems, but you don't really need a past family and social history. If you go to detailed, a level three new patient visit, then you would need the history of the present illness, which we as allergists do very well. Uh, but you also you need a more complete review of systems, and you need the past family and social history. So you, you, as you think about this, you, you remember that you have to document this. A lot of times you might have talked to the patient about what did they do, what is their social history, but you have to have it in the chart for the insurance company to pay you for it. So uh, a lot of uh, records that we see will have relatively complete information, but not enough that they've really satisfied the criteria of uh, the CPT code. On the next slide, you can see uh, for a history of present illness, uh, we want specific indications. Uh, and you can see location, quality, severity, duration, timing, context, modifying factors, associated signs. So if you have a patient with a symptom, then you can describe that symptom more effectively. And we've all learned this in medical school, but, but you have to actually document it on a chart. So if you look at what's the difference between brief and extended on the next slide, uh, you can see that a brief history of present illness has uh, three elements, whereas extended has, um, has more than that, basically five elements, uh, location and severity and so forth. And you can think about this in your patients. Uh, a, a patient comes in and complains of an earache. Well, is the earache sharp, dull? Is it burning? Uh, is it the right ear, the left ear? Has it been going on for hours, days, months? And you can you can think about well, what do you want to tell somebody about that earache? And the more information, the more of these key points you give, the higher the level of the history of the present illness. So, as I say, we as allergists are usually pretty good at this. We we usually have fairly complete uh, HPIs. Go to the next slide, and, and we're going. This is looking again at the components. We don't always see new patients; we see follow-up patients. And, and is, if you are looking at a level three follow-up visit, it requires an expanded problem-focused history. Now, if you'll notice in the expanded problem-focused history, one of the things that it requires is a review of systems. And it's going to be a specific review of systems, but it has to have a review of systems. So if you bill an insurance company and you don't have somewhere in your chart that you've done a review of systems, they're going to say you haven't met the criteria for that level of service. So they're going to either pay you for a level two, which doesn't require uh, the review of systems, or not pay you at all. And if you bill for a level four follow-up visit, you not only have to have a review of systems, but you have to have past family and social history. So somewhere on that chart for a level four visit, you have to have both a review of systems and a PFSH, past family social history. And, and 
those are the areas that I see most commonly uh, people getting dinged for not having fulfilled the uh, documentation requirements. In the next slide we get into the review of systems and, and they there a whole list of systems that you can uh, discuss with the patient. Uh, you, you all know these. Uh, on the next slide you can see what the criteria are for whether it's problem pertinent. Uh, in other words, it, it's okay for a uh, level three visit or if it's extended, uh, which is required for a follow-up level four visit. So for a level, uh, for the problem pertinent, it just has to be a review of systems about that organ system. <laughs> if it's extended, then it has to include that organ system plus additional organ systems. And then for, for the more comprehensive, uh, it has to have 10 or more. And you can put in your note uh, that you've, you've reviewed them. Uh, you should have the pertinent negative so that if you're talking about somebody with asthma, you should talk about whether they have shortness of breath, whether they have dyspneal exertion, whether they have coughing, wheezing, nocturnal awakenings, and things like that. Uh, and if they don't have those, you should say they don't have them. But you don't have to go into detail about urinary symptoms or about the skin or about uh, uh, whether or not they have palpitations and, and so forth. But you want pertinent negatives, and you want uh, you want to say that I've reviewed at least ten systems, and they were as follows. Okay, so uh, just to uh, move on, then the the next slide again. If you look at the uh, the final component is the past family and social history. And uh, here we're asking the questions about uh, the patient's uh, family history, which in allergy we almost always do, and, and you just need to document that. And so on the next slide it shows you uh, what those questions are. It's the past uh, history and illnesses, operations, injuries, and treatments. We're pretty good about that. The problem is that we don't always document it. Family history we always ask about, I think, and again, usually we'll document it on the first visit, but remember, if you're billing uh, at a higher level for uh, a, a follow-up visit, then you need to also have something about the past family and social history. So you, you have to think about putting that back in. And the easiest way of doing it is to just refer back to a previous visit. Uh, and you can say, if you're doing a level four follow visit, and the past family history uh, has not changed from the visit of a month ago or a year ago, you can note that in the chart. Uh, discuss uh, family social history unchanged from visit of July of 2010. So if my okay, brother so the, had rhinitis, he still had rhinitis a month later. So Gary, do you have to do you have to document that in a level three follow up, or is it only a level four follow up? Uh, for the PFSH, only a level four follow up. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, on that same uh, line of reasoning, you do have to for a level three follow up, you do have to have something about the uh, review of systems. Okay. Okay. In the family history, do you, does it have to be like all medical diseases, or is it okay if our major focus obviously is on atopic disease and things that are more related to us? Like, do we have to know if they, you know who had cardiovascular disease and diabetes and other things that may not be as pertinent to us? Yeah, you're really you're exactly right. You really want to focus on what is going to be relevant to the exam and the and the question at the time. I always ask, does, the, does you, do your parents, do, do, do the mom or the dad have allergies or asthma or eczema, that, that kind of stuff? To kind of focus that rather than what yeah, kind of problem. I, mean, I don't really care, care if they have kidney disease. Kidney disease, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you, you, want it, you want it complete, but you want it relevant, too. Yeah. And that's, what, that's what's important. And, and we're, we're really pretty good about social history. We ask people about where they work and what they do and about uh, their environment and their exercise and so forth, but uh, just make sure that you document it. Yeah, I mean, the environment's the social history, and we always get that, so that, that does, it, does it. All right, and, and let me point out again, uh, your chart may be reviewed by somebody who doesn't understand, and so the more clear you make your chart, the easier it is going to be for a reviewer. And so if you label something as past family or social history, 
they can go to it and see that you've done it. If you include that information in your uh, history of the present illness, then you'll probably have to, if you get denied and you appeal, you'll probably have to point out, uh, well, I did ask them about this. It just was up in this other part of the record. And they'll, they'll give you credit for it, but it's a hassle to do that. So the, the more specific you can be and the more you can outline for somebody that doesn't have your level of expertise, the easier it's going to be to get it past them on the first go. That's why we have templates that have uh, categories, of these topics all out, specifically listed. Yeah, that's a great way of doing it. Yeah. The next slide just shows you the, the different components of the past family and social history there. Uh, this shows you pertinent, which is uh, just in the areas related directly to the problem, which is just exactly what we were talking about. And then uh, the second one, uh, the, the more complete on the next slide, uh, says that you're asking about uh, review of two or uh, all three areas, that is the uh, the family history that we all ask about, the social history that we most mostly ask about, and then past medical uh, illnesses as well. And, and I think on new patient visits, we're all good at this, but on follow-up visits, we don't always document that we did it, and we don't always remember to, uh, to put in that documentation. Do you think eventually genetic testing is going to replace the need for family history? If, if a patient has single nucleotide polymorphisms or genes for specific diseases, do we really care about the family history at that point? I don't know if it'll it'll replace it, but it certainly would uh, be a surrogate for it. So if you have right. that information and you put that in the chart, then I think you would be considered having done the family history. I would think that would be more relevant than what, whether your grandmother had rhinitis. Or, anyway, never mind. Go on. Continue. Okay. Uh, we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit about the physical exam now. And the, the physical examination uh, is, is divided either into organ systems or a single organ system. Like for allergy, a lot of times we'll concentrate on the respiratory system. And uh, although we'll examine other systems, we won't do it to the same extent. And, and what we feel is that if you're using the 1995 documentation guidelines, that if you do a complete allergy exam and you feel that you've looked at all of the relevant areas for a, a good allergy examination, you can call that a comprehensive allergy exam. As we'll see, uh, when you look at other, when you look at the 97 guidelines, they specifically tell you what they consider complete or uh, problem focused and so forth. Okay, the next slide. Uh, the next slide looks at this first question: What are the body areas that we're talking about? Uh, the head and neck and so forth, and what are the organ systems, and we'll go back to the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, respiratory, and so forth. So these are organ systems or uh, body areas, and the exams are identified as to how many of these you evaluate and, uh, and what you find there. The types of exams are shown on the next slide, and those are either a general, uh, which is a multi-system exam, or a single organ system exam. And, and I think most of us do, would do a general uh, multi-system exam, at least on the first visit. But if a person is only having uh, a follow-up visit for their rhinitis, we may spend a lot of time on the upper airway and not worry about uh, the color of their nails or the, or the uh, rate of their heart. So we're going to be doing a single organ system exam and, and looking mostly at the respiratory system. The next slide breaks down the phys physical exam, just like we broke down the his history initially. And you can see they're the same uh, designations, problem focused, expanded problem focused, detailed, and comprehensive. And those all tie back to the level of service. And, and on uh, the right side, you can see what the definitions uh, are describing. The comprehensive at the bottom, it's either a general multi-system examination or a complete examination of a single organ system. And that's where you get into the major difference between the 95 and 97 guidelines. Complete examination of a single organ system is not defined in 1995, but it is defined in 1997. And I'll show you a couple of those in upcoming slides. OK, on the next slide, we are 
looking at the difference between the the uh, systems, and I'm only putting this up here for you. I'll go through this very quickly because I want to point out to you that the, the differences in the type of examination are defined by the number of areas that you examine. And so it can be either the one to five elements uh, in the problem focused, uh, six or more in the expanded problem focused, or 12 uh, or more, <coughs> more in the uh, detailed. And so that's the way a reviewer is going to look at your chart. In the, in the comprehensive on the next slide, uh, you can see, again, that they're looking for uh, bullets, what they call bullet points, and I'll show you what those are, and gray areas, shaded or unshaded areas, which, and I'll show you what those are. But these are all in these documentation guidelines. They have charts of each one of these. And actually, on the next uh, slide is a chart of one of these that you can look at. So this is the ears, nose, and throat exam. And you can see the bullet points. And that's what they're talking about when they mean bullet points. And you can see at, up at the top they show you 1 to 5 bullets is problem focused, 6 to 11 uh, bullets is expanded, 12 or more bullets is detailed, and then comprehensive they want at least one bullet in each box with an unshaded border and every bullet in the box with a shaded border. So that basically would be what you would record on your note for a complete uh, ENT exam. Mm -hmm. The other exam that allergists sometimes use are shown on the next slide, and that's the uh, what is the hematologic uh, lymphatic immunologic exam. And again, it follows the same guidelines. These are from the 1997 guidelines, and it just shows you what you would need. Uh, to fulfill the qualifications for anything from problem focus to comprehensive. Okay, so it's all detailed, and that's what I don't like, or what makes it more difficult to reach the comprehensive level with the 97. With the 95, it's just uh, verbal. It says a complete exam of the system in question, and that's easier to reach because that's what you decide it is. Okay, so we're going to leave. Uh, history and physical, if everybody's okay with that, and move on to the third key component, which is medical decision making. And this this is somewhat of a problem because it uh, it entails three different aspects of what you're doing in making your decision: the number of diagnoses that you're looking at, the amount of complexity uh, of data that you're going to be reviewing, and then the risk uh, of the patient. And or the risk of what you're doing in the patient's uh, potential morbidity and mortality. And, and they take these three components and they break them down into uh, determining a different level of medical decision making, straightforward up to high complexity. And um, this is important in a new patient visit because you need all three components, history, physical, and medical decision making, whereas with a uh, follow-up visit, you just need any two components. You can either use the history and the physical, or you can use the history plus the medical decision-making, or you can use the physical plus the medical decision-making to determine your level of service. And, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, because I, I think it's really something that's easier to do if you sit down and look at the charts and go over it on your own and kind of get a gestalt of what, what are they talking about here, and how severe is this patient that I'm looking at uh, when I decide whether it's straightforward or high complexity medical decision making. The next couple of slides are, are tables of risk, uh, and these are all in the CPT books, and they kind of are, are trying to give you some ideas of uh, different possible presenting problems and what the risk would be, like uh, supplemented minor problem, uh, insect bite uh, would be minimal. Uh, you think about not doing a lot of testing and the management object, object uh, options would be minimal, low risk, uh, a, few, a few problems, uh, maybe some more testing, and uh, probably recommending over-the-counter drugs or just some, uh, some simple things for them to do. And then on the next slide with the moderate and high risk, uh, you can see in moderate risk we're getting into more complex problems. Uh, importantly, the management op options here include prescription drug management. So when you when you do prescription drug management, at least from, from the management option uh, standpoint, you're already at a moderate risk. 
Sure. One of the things that's hard for us to do with new patients is to get to a high level of medical decision making because, as you can see, uh, they're talking about fairly sophisticated testing. They're talking about uh, patients who have multiple uh, illnesses, uh, potential life-threatening. I think we do this with anaphylaxis. I think we do it with severe asthma, but we don't do it with allergic rhinitis. So if you're billing level fives for patients with allergic rhinitis, you're probably going to get asked, why are you doing this? Uh, on the next slide, I'm going to show you one of those cheat sheets that I told you about. And they're, these are on the internet. Uh, they're really handy to have. This is one for new patients or consults. And so you can look at uh, your history of the present illness and how many of the uh, factors you ask about. You can look at review of systems uh, and then medical decision making and, and exam. And you can see across the top, you have the levels of visit, uh, level one through level five. And then you can, you can use this type of a chart uh, to decide what level did you actually uh, attain. And the this, this same chart on the next slide uh, shows uh, more, a little more clearly uh, what some of the questions are that you're going to be asking yourself. So this is, again, these are, these are available for you on the internet. And I think they may be on the Joint Council website. I'm not positive about this. On the next slide, uh, we have the same kind of concept for the physical exam. And you can see it across the top, the levels of uh, new patient visits from one to five, and what would be required for your physical exam for billing at that level. And then finally, for medical decision making on the next slide, uh, you can see the same kind of concept. So these, these tables that uh, are available that you can put in the exam room, you can have all of this uh, at your fingertips and pretty easily accessible when you're seeing a patient and deciding on what level am I going to bill for this patient. Fortunately, and I think this is fortunate, uh, the electronic health records, a lot of these have already incorporated these types of tables into the programs. So if, you've, if you have satisfied these, then the electronic health record kind of tells you this qualifies for a level three visit, uh, or it doesn't qualify, and why it doesn't qualify. And, and so I think that as we move more toward electronic health records, uh, some of this documentation will will become easier. Okay, so that's that. Those are the levels of visits. Let's move to the next slide, and we'll get into a little bit different aspect of this. Um, when we were looking at those first slides and talking about the the new patient visits, I said that uh, that level one might take ten minutes, and uh, there were these times in there. You can't bill based on that time of level one or the 20 minutes for level two if you're doing a history of physical and medical decision making, and that is taking the majority of your time. On the other hand, think about what we do in allergy. We have a patient come in. We do a complete physical and history exam uh, on the patient. Uh, we, we do medical decision making. We decide what we're going to do. We might skin test a patient. Uh, we might do pulmonary functions. Sometimes we don't do all that in the same day. Sometimes uh, we would see a patient do a, a history and a physical examination and find out that they were taking antihistamines and say, well, once you're off your antihistamines, come back in and we'll do some allergy testing to find out what's wrong. So they come back in maybe a week later or so, and they're off their antihistamines, and you do the testing. And you want to spend some time explaining what their test showed. Uh, you're not going to do a history and physical because you just did one. So you're going to spend a lot of time with the patient explaining how they can do the dust control or, or why their animals are bad for them or whatever the uh, conference may entail. But the majority of that time is going to be spent talking to the patient and counseling and working with the patient. In a situation where more than 50% of the face-to-face -face time is counseling and coordination of care, you can use the amount of time to decide the level of service. The only important thing that you need with this is that you have to put in your chart the amount of face-to-face -face time, and you have to document in the chart what took that much time to do face-to-face. -face. So you can't just say, uh, spent 15 minutes with the patient uh, and bill level three follow-up visit. You have to say, discussed dust and mold control, 
uh, discuss proper way of using medications, uh, whatever you did, but it has to have enough substance that it really would have taken you 15 minutes to do that. And it, it, it actually could have taken you 10 minutes, but as long as it was more than half of the 15 minutes that you spent with the patient, that's all that's required for this uh, billing based on time. And I think we as allergists miss out on this a lot because we spend a lot of time with our patients talking to them about their medicines, about environmental control, about asthma control, and the majority of the time we've spent may be in counseling and coordination. And you can see from this chart, if you spend 40 minutes to the patient with the patient and 25 minutes of that 40 minutes is spent on counseling and coordination of care, that's already a level five follow-up visit. If you spend 15 minutes, which I think all of us do, and 50% of that or more is counseling coordination of care, that's already a level three visit. So this is something that should always be in the back of your mind when you're seeing patients for follow-up, is how long does it take and am I spending a lot of time on counseling and coordination of care? Okay, on the next slide uh, is another thing that we sometimes miss, and that is these prolonged service visits, uh, prolonged visit codes. And these are two codes, and the first code is for the, for the initial time, and the second code is for supplemental time. Uh, so the first code is uh, 99354, and uh, then the second code is what's called an add-on code. So you always build the 99354, and then if you have more time, then you build 99355. It's interesting because uh, these codes can be used for a variety of purposes. There are two examples that are given in CPT assistance, which I'll talk to you about in just a second. But one of the examples in CPT assistance for using these prolonged visit codes would be a patient who cannot hear, and the extra work of communicating with the patient requires more than 30 minutes beyond the typical time. So we talked about this. Uh, level one new patient visit, 99201, we said that the CMS expects the typical time for that code to be 10 minutes. If you go 30 minutes beyond that, or 40 minutes total, then you can bill 99354 in addition to 99201, and you can, you'll be paid more. If you, and you can see for each one of the new patient codes what that 30 minutes uh, additional time would would uh, uh, be to be able to bill for that code, and then you can see what additional time you would need to bill for the 99355 code. So you can see all the times here. And I think on the next slide are the times for the follow-up visits, the same concept. So it's even easier with the follow-up visit because the times are shorter. Gary? But don't miss out on billing for these uh, codes. For the follow-up visit, for instance, the, the example they use in CPT is an asthmatic who comes into the office and gets frequent treatment, and so the doctor has to go in and check on them periodically through the day, and, and over the course of the time the patient is being treated for their asthma exacerbation, the doctor actually spends a couple of hours face-to-face -face time with the patient. It might have been over a three or four hour period uh, during the day when the patient is getting NEDS and uh, epi or whatever is going on. But, but you can use a prolonged service code for that visit and get paid more than you would have if you had not uh, build the extra codes. So two codes to think about, or two concepts to think about. One is billing based on time, and the other is the prolonged visit codes. And, you, and the, these are both very helpful in getting paid for the time that you're spending with your patients. Gary? Um, uh, yes. It's Paul Dowling. Um, we have a, an increasing number of, of um, patients who do not speak English as their primary language, um, and we, have, we use interpreters. Um, and as you said, that usually takes an excessive amount of time to to basically do everything at, at least twice or three times if the fellow's involved, plus the fact that we're, we also spend time, a lot of times, waiting for an interpreter um, as well. Um, so, I mean, cause those, for, for, for interpreter services where you have to spend more time going over this again and again, um, uh, can that be used as well? Yes, but it's for the face-to-face -face time. So yeah. you, you can use it for that. You can't wait for the time it takes the interpreter to get to the floor and, and to see the patient with you. But yes, you can use it. And, and the documentation is actually in the CPT assistant uh, in July of 2009. So uh, you definitely can use it for that. Well, 
Okay. Dr. Griffin, can I ask you a question? This is Sean Stang, an allergy fellow. Um, I just want to clarify. So this is be a prolonged visit code. The codes 99212 on the left all the way through 99215, are those, the, are those the, the complexity of the visits? And then you'd use the, the typical time code next to that based on that complexity? Yes. But so the, the level, level 2, 3, 4, or 5 relates to how extensive the history and the physical exam were that you did on the patient. And those are the times or the typical times that CPT expects for those levels sure. of complexity. I see. OK. OK. OK? Yep. Everybody, everybody good? Good. OK, let's spend, let's spend the, the remaining time on specific allergy codes. And, and again, you can see this is, is just taken out of the CPT book. Uh, on the next slide, some of the codes that we use uh, that I want to go over with you and that, that uh, go, go on to the next, there you go. Uh, so the more common codes, and these are the codes that you really should know uh, well. 99504 is, is uh, percutaneous test, that's the uh, prick puncture test that we do. Uh, if you're doing it for, for uh, biologics, drugs, or venoms, it's 95010. I will tell you now that that's probably going to be changed in the future. So we'll have a single test for venoms and another single test code for drugs and biologics. But for, for the current next probably three years, 95004 and 95010 are the uh, skin prick tests. The intradermal tests are 95024, the one we use commonly for allergy extracts, and 95015, the ones we use for drugs, biologics, and venoms. Uh, and so you should, those are the codes that you commonly use. Those are the skin test codes, as we call them, and you should know those well. You'll notice that when you read the uh, description, it says, report by physician, specify number of tests. So if you're doing 95004 and you do 10 uh, tests, then the units number would be 10. And you do include the positive and negative controls. So if you do eight antigens in a positive and negative control, you've done 10 units of 95004. Okay? So that's, the, that's the, the description of the test and how you bill it. And then I told you about the CPT assistant. Look at under there. You can see uh, their references, CPT assistant summer 1991, uh, and so forth. So a lot of these codes, there's been something that written about the code that may have some implications as to the way it's supposed to be used. And it's in this uh, publication called the CPT Assistant, which you can look at online. And um, and and you, I don't know if you all get it uh, in a uh, paper format, but it comes out uh, I think once a month in a paper format. Okay. On the next slide, uh, some more codes that we use all the time, uh, and you can see these are inhalation challenge codes, uh, and then allergy immunotherapy codes. On the immunotherapy codes, there are only two codes for injections, 95115 and 95117. 95115 is to give allergy shots. So when you give an allergy shot, you don't use a code for subcutaneous injections as you would for, say, a penicillin shot or an epinephrine shot. You use a specific code for allergy shots. And we actually get paid a little bit more for these codes, uh, and they're two options that you have. 95115 is when you give one shot. 95117 is when you give two or more shots. So if you have a patient on three vials and is getting, they're getting one shot out of each of those three vials, they're getting three injections, but you can only bill 95117 for giving all three injections because it says two or more. So you can't put more units in 95115 or 95117. Okay, which is, has been a little bit of a problem with some people. And also, you cannot use the subcutaneous injection codes when you're giving allergy immunotherapy. Uh, the way insurance companies look at this is they will look, if you, if you put down a code for giving an, a shot, uh, subcutaneous injection, they'll look for another code that tells them what you gave. Like, is there a J code for penicillin or is there a J code for epinephrine? If there's not a code for that particular uh, product, that drug, then they won't pay you because they'll say, well, you billed us for the administration, but you didn't tell us what you gave, so we're not going to pay you. So always use the allergy immunotherapy codes when you're giving allergy shots. 
On the next slide, the other next slide, the other important uh, code for us is nine five one six five, and that that's the extract that we make. So that code is the uh, charge that we give to the insurance company for going over the patient's chart, finding out what they're allergic to, deciding what is the what are the best antigens to put in the mix, how we should give that uh, extract, over what period of time, whether we're going to do rush, whether we're going to do uh, conventional, to, to think all that thought that goes into making up the extract and deciding on how how we're going to use it, as well as uh, supervising the preparation of it. And so the, the mix of the vial from the time you think about it to the time it's actually put into the vial is what we're billing for in 95165 plus the antigens that are in the vial. In that regard, what we what the units are for that cost are the number of doses. So you can see it says uh, single or multiple antigens specifying number of doses. And so the units for 95165 are the anticipated number of doses. If you uh, have a schedule where you say, well, out of the first vial, I usually give five injections, then you can't bill for 10 injections out of that vial because you already have a sheet of paper that says, well, I usually think about giving five injections of the first vial. And we have a build-up schedule. I'm sure you all have something that's similar where you have a certain number of injections from each of the build-up doses, and those are the numbers of units you should bill for. Don't bill for more than that, or they'll come back and, and ask you for money back. Um, and no matter how many antigens you put into the vial, you still bill for the number of, of uh, doses. Dr. Gross, I'm just going to. I was just going to say, yeah. I know that I know that there's some insurance companies that are moving more towards, um, or at least have attempted to kind of move into what Medicare bills on, say, you know, one dose is considered one cc, whereas you know, like you just said. There's more than you know. There's more doses in one particular vial. That's absolutely correct. Medicare has a further restriction in that they will only pay for the concentrate. They won't pay for the dilution. Right. And they pay. Their units are actually per mL. So they will pay for every mL that you put in the vial, but they won't. Uh, if you if you give a half an mL, so you intend to get 20 doses out of that 10 mL vial, they'll only pay for. 10 units or 10 mLs. Okay, so there is a difference in the billing for 95165 if it's a Medicare patient compared to a non-Medicare patient. Hmm. And, and just as you say, uh, some of the insurance companies, we've seen Blue Cross do this in some areas, some of the insurance companies are now adopting the Medicare billing rules. So uh, that's something to be aware of. Okay? Okay. Uh, the, the final two slides uh, I'll just go over really briefly because I just want to point out to you that there are some influenza uh, or excuse me some vaccine uh, codes that are not always in CPT and actually the the next slide shows uh, some codes that are from that AMA website that I gave you earlier and you can see at the bottom that one of these codes is not actually going to be in the CPT book until 2012 and the the reason these are sometimes important is because the vaccine will get approved uh, and so it will be available for us to use, but it take, there's this lag of, of time after approval until it actually gets in print in the CPT books. But the codes are still available for you on the, the AMA website under that CPT uh, uh, button. So you can go to the AMA website, hit the CPT button, and find out what the new codes are going to be, particularly for vaccines. So I'm going to stop there, uh, and, and I'd be happy if you all have time to uh, answer any questions that you may have. I will also tell you that uh, in the Joint Council, we take questions by email. And so if, they're co if you're a member of the Joint Council and you have questions about coding, uh, you can email our website, uh, and we will try and find the answers for you. And remember what I said, the first place I'll look will be on Google to see if I can find the answer for you if I don't know it. Uh, so you might do that yourself and beat me to the uh, to the answer that way. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Gross, for this presentation. We're going to have to stop here because uh, our conference room, there's another conference scheduled. Uh, every time I hear you give this presentation, um, I get more and more nervous about how accurately I'm doing things, but I'm, 
I also learned just a tremendous amount from you. So uh, you know, this has been really helpful. Thank you so much. I would encourage everyone to go to the Joint Council. It's jcaai.org website. Uh, that's where you can communicate with the Joint Council. If you have questions, uh, send them in. Also, everybody needs to be a member, and uh, we'll download those application forms for our fellows. Online. Thank you, Dr. Gross, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us on Conferences Online Allergy in Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.